مساء الخير يا جميع المشاهدين في لبنان والعالم وهو على مقاعد الدراسة الجامعية افتتح محلا صغيرا لتصوير المستندات على الطريق العام المؤدي إلى حرم جامعة كاليفورنيا في سانتا باربرا نحن في العام 1970 وكان أيضا يبيع الأقلام والدفاتر ومختلف لوازم التلاميذ فكان كينكوز من منكم أصدقائي المشاهدين سواء كنتم تعيشون في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أو زرتم إحدى هذه البلايات لم يسمع يزر أو يتآلف مع هذا الاسم وهذا المتجر المنتشر اليوم في أكثر من ألف ومئتي نقطة بيع أو فرع هذه السلسلة هي من ابتكار لبناني سوري عربي رفضه المجتمع فقط لأنه عسير أي يعاني من عسر القراءة والفهم غير أنه نجح في استخدام الاختلافات في التعلم ومقاربته غير العادية للأعمال لتصميم ثقافة رحيمة وغير تقليدية تقوم على الشراكة وتسمح له بالنضال والتفوق الليلة أحاور بول أورفالي مساء الخير Nice to see you. The Thank pleasure you. is mine. Hello. I'm really happy to have you and to host you tonight. I think the interview will have a great impact. This is what I feel and this is what I forecast. And all the people who are watching us tonight will be so happy, especially women, watching you and seeing you and listening to you. Well, thank you. You could say marhaba. Marhaba. <laughs> Paul Orfali, uh, you have learning differences and you were able to bring a change. Thus, ignite or make a difference. You think you're lucky. Both lucky and uh, I think I had a great parents uh, and a great culture of the Lebanese culture that had Shofi, Ime, and just to know how to build respect. Shofi means uh, yes. uh, be, be, show yourself. Show yourself. Be proud of yourself. Yes. And Ime, it's, uh, it's value. value. Build respect. Exactly. Yes. Value added and value built. Yes. Uh, your eyes believe what they see. Do, you, do your eyes always tell the truth? Your eyes believe what they see, your ears believe others. And uh, what happens a lot of times is I think we're so preoccupied in life, we're not present. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think being present means that you can see opportunity. Now, if I reflect back on my contribution at Kinko's, it's that I was always in the business, go store to store to store, looking for what people are doing right. You can make a lot of money sitting in the office mm -hmm. worrying about what's wrong, but every store there was an idea or something that was going right. Mm. Paul, what about what you don't see? With which sense do you perceive it? All senses, your stomach. I, I think that people don't listen to their stomach. For an example... They feel it. You feel it. Yeah. If you fall in love with a woman here and you don't love her here, you get a stomach ache here. Yeah. If you fall in love with a woman here and you don't love her here, you get a stomach ache here. Mm -hmm. So where do you fall in love? You fall in love with your stomach. It's your intuition and your stomach is the combination of all the senses. It's anxiety. Anxiety. And anxiety triggers what? Ambition. Ambition. Uh, Paul, you've been rejected by society when you were young. Uh, today, uh, you are invaded by society, by almost everybody. Uh, how do you assess your relation with the others? Well, I think you have two choices in life. You have a choice of viewing the world as a very arbitrary place that's not of trust, and people are always out to get you. Or, if you're lucky enough to have my skills in life, you have to trust, because I'm not capable of doing too much. I can't read well, I can't sit still well, I have no mechanical ability whatsoever. So if I, you're, you're lucky enough not to take yourself too seriously, you have to rely on others. You train five days a week, and uh, you claimed that you want to be beautiful in the outside and the in, uh, in the inside too. Uh, what is beauty for you? It's curiosity. You just see it in the eyes. You just know it. Beauty is uh, in the eyes. People thought you were weird when you were young and you felt awkward. Uh, personally, how do you look at those people? How do you see them yourself? I think in life there's always two parts of you. You always have the 13-year-old and the adult. Mm. And the rapture of life is the, 
is the conflict of both. But everybody has a 13-year-old in them, and the adult. The 13-year-old is vulnerable, has anxiety, insecure. Is it latent, or is it always living? It's always living. You always have the 13-year-old, yeah. and you always have the adult, and they're always in conflict. Yeah. Do you have a balance within you? Yeah, I have a good balance. I try to be mischievous like the 13-year-old, but I have an adult side. But I think that's the rapture of life. Right. Everybody can examine themselves. They're all 13 at times, and they're all adults, and that's the big war. Do you attempt to discover yourself every day? I think it's very important. What do you find? What do you see? We, to rediscover who you are every day. Wake up refreshed and renewed and say, what's really going on in my world? When we read the newspaper, the whole world changed from one day to the next. The stock market and the financial markets are all about rediscovering from this moment to this moment, reevaluating the whole world. Mm. Are you always proud of what you see when you wake up in the morning? I'm always perplexed. Perplexed. I'm more. It's more fun living a life of uh, perplexion, always amused. The whole world is so interesting. But I don't know if I'm proud as much as curious. The world is interesting, but it's also confusing. That's what I like the best. Yeah. I think the confusion of life is the best part. Predictability, I mean, who wants predictability? What about chaos? I like chaos. Mm. I like is your life chaotic or is it organized? Both. I think that's the rapture of life, is having, uh, being improvisational yeah. and also have a path. Because if you don't, you don't see to the left and to the right, you're going to miss a lot. Yeah. So you should be always alert. Yeah. The biggest problem with young people and people today is they're not alert. They're preoccupied. They're on the phone. They're watching the television. They're visiting. They're making the makeup. They're doing whatever. And they're not alert. They're not seeing what's really around them. Very important to be present. Is your thinking uh, uh, organized or chaotic also? Is it simple or complex? I'm a very simple thinker. I'm a very, very simple yeah. thinker. I guess the problem is people have too much time in their hands sometimes when they focus on something and they don't think as simple as possible. Because they work too hard. Well, I think they work too hard and they don't know how to think, get the, see the forest through the trees. For example, uh, E equal MC squared by Albert Einstein. They wrote books and books and books. He wrote it in three pages. Hmm. It convinced the world of the uh, nature of matter. Are you able to maintain a work-life balance? Oh, very important. And that's what I think I learned from my parents in the Lebanese culture, is to be successful in life. It's like a tripod. You have to have three things in balance, work, love, and play. And I saw that my parents, they knew how to work, they knew how to have a good love life, and they knew how to play. Mm. All three in balance make you a success. Very important concept. Mm. At the age of 36, uh, you've met an Italian woman. You fell in love with her. Her name was Natalie. She became your wife. Uh, what did you see in her? Oh, good family. And uh, just a person you can trust. And I, I think trust is the most important aspect in life. Mm. I trusted her from the day I met her. And I loved her from the day I met her. So she's just a soulmate. But you can't have a soulmate without trust. Trust, family, love are issues that will be dwelled. We'll be talking about them right after this break. <laughs> نعود لمتابعة وراء الوجوه مع بول أورفري مؤسس متاجر كينكوس العالمية المنتشرة في جميع الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وهو ليلة معنا في بيروت في هذا الحوار من القلب إلى القلب بول أورفري وانا أسيو if your dad and mom are dead you said no they're here tell us everything about Albert Orfali the owner of a big factory for women's clothing and your mom Virginia Nahas well 
I don't have to go far to see them because they're such a part of you, your parents. Mm -hmm. My father was very uh, dignified and poised and true gentleman. And my mother was a true lady, but also very funny. And they would just have company and they would visit. And most of my life was just listening to my parents talk and their friends and so much wisdom in the conversation. You know, as a child, you pretend like you don't hear, but I heard everything. Now you hear them differently now. Not the same way. Mm. They, no, they, they're always here with me. Mm. Always. Your grandparents left Lebanon in 1905, even before the First World War. You therefore belong to the second generation, which was born in the USA. Uh, what do you know about Lebanon? I know that the, what I knew prior or what I know now. What I knew prior is I thought there was a lot of uh, problems, and guns and killing. And now I see a beautiful country that people get along and very safe, a lot of opportunities, uh, people that are, have, have it in their eyes. Besides what you're reading in the newspapers <coughs> and besides watching the news, and the following, far away from the States, what was happening in Lebanon, uh, were you fed uh, with love for that country? I think uh, they were telling me with a wonderful culture, how you learn so much from each other, and uh, just the values of Lebanese. What are the values of Lebanese? I work, love, and play. I think that summarizes it best. So my that parents, was your cultural heritage? My cultural heritage is your business is your business. Mm. It's not that you don't let you own your business. It owns, you own it. You enjoy your family. You know how to laugh. And uh, I think that that's the most wonderful aspect of the Lebanese culture. Curiosity, family, uh, loving relationships. Uh, your cousin, uh, Tom Barak has been one of the guests of my show, and he told me, and he said in the show, that the Lebanese people leave Lebanon in a cargo, but they come back in a private jet. And this shows the greatness of the human mind and the smartness of the Lebanese people, more specifically. What do you say yourself? Well, I think if you go back to the history, from what I see of the Lebanese, there were always, somebody's coming, <coughs> taking them over, the Germans, the French, the mm. English, the, uh, Everybody takes them over, the Persians, the Iraqis, the everybody. All. And I think the Lebanese people just basically say, look it, you figure out the government, I'll just try to sell you something. And they just knew how to get along. And they were very good merchants. And I think they say to themselves, look at politics, that's up to you. I'll sell you something. I want to enjoy my family, enjoy my loved ones. But I think that they became very good at buying and selling. You've mentioned the word trade. Why? Do Lebanese talk business all the time? Why are they business oriented? Well, I think it's their art form. The art form, uh, unfortunately, artists are only considered painters or musicians, or, but art is business. I mean, making something out of nothing is, is art. Like in our business, Kinko's, I used to try to do the lighting. I tried to make the people happy. I made the decor interesting. That's artistic work. And so I view that being a good business person is artist, artistry. Do you own your business or does your business own you? You own your business. The big mistake is you lose the objectivity. For an example, for me, there was two circles. There was Kinko and there was Paul. A lot of times your business and that, uh, your business and you overlap. To, you can't see, but you make much better decisions if your business is here and you are here and you own it, it doesn't own you. Very important. But many people are unfortunately owned by their businesses. They get seduced. Mm. Yes, men more than women, because men define themselves by what they do for a living. Women are better, more objective about it. If you own your business, does it mean you own life? Yes, if you own your own business, you own life. In other words, whatever business you're in, if you own it, and it doesn't own you. For an example, I see these cell phones constantly. Mm. You're a slave to the phone, slave. It owns you, this stupid little phone, and it can interrupt you constantly. I think a lot of people have interruptions. There's a, uh, 
story about a frog. A frog sits in the bottle of water, and they gradually increase the temperature. And the frog will stay there and boil to death. However, if a frog jumps from the, uh, jumps into the hot water, it'll jump right out. You can't deduce gradual increases in temperature. You just sit there and boil to death, like the frog. A lot of us uh, are boiling frogs. We let our business own us. We let the cell phone own us. We let our weight own us, our propensity to eat, smoking cigarettes own us. But how many of us reappraise every day and say, what can I do to, is this, is this a habit I don't want to have? Very important in life, reappraising. Don't let yesterday be overbearing on tomorrow. Talking about the frog, let's talk about the monkey. When, when you were five or six years old, your parents took you to the zoo. You were blonde, with blonde and red hair, and blue eyes, and something happened over there. Yes, I didn't look like my brothers and sisters. They're very dark complected with dark eyes. You were compared to a monkey. Yeah, by my brother and sister. You were the monkey of the family. I was the, well, they went to the zoo, and they looked at an albino monkey, my sister and brother, and said that my parents' real baby died, and they went to the zoo and got an albino monkey. And uh, that was me. I was the albino monkey by my brother and sister. And I don't know if you remember the Mickey Mouse song. It was M-I-N-K-E-Y-Y, -Y, Mickey Mouse. I was always M-O-N-K-E-Y-Y, -Y, because you're a monkey, C-H-I-L-D, monkey child. Mm. I was always monkey child. Did that affect you? No. I think, it, <clears throat> I think in life, uh, your childhood can be viewed two ways. It can defeat you or enable you. And I think you need to have a lot of reversals in life. For an example, my mother used to say, in your 20s, you try everything. In your 30s, you figure out what you do best. 40s, make money from what you do best. 50s, don't do too much. Mm. But that's the way I you try, experiment. For an example, a baby. A baby learns to grab something. Right? It goes like this. It learns where it is. What does a baby do? It's learning where it is by finding out where it isn't. It's learning from its mistakes. The first thing you do in life is learn from your mistakes. Were there so many of your mistakes? Oh, yes, many. Many. What was the biggest one? Oh, I didn't buy Microsoft in time. No, I, I uh, didn't buy uh, oh, a lot of mistakes. Had you bought one? Would have been able to work on it? I think I would have uh, I believed more in myself. I think the inner demons destroy you a lot. And so I think I probably would have uh, approached life a little more confidently. But you do believe in yourself big time. Well, after 58 years. You know what? In your 20s, you care what people think about you. In your 40s, you don't really care what they think about you. In your 60s, you realize people never thought of you in the first place. But Orfeli, how do you raise your kids, your 14 and 18 years old kids? We try to teach them the value of money. It's hard. Uh, but uh, my wife's into the school. I'm not as much into that. But I want them to understand the value of a dollar. I always, I, whatever, however old they are, if they're 10, they had a little book, and they had to save some, give some and spend some. And they had a little book with an envelope. And I was always interested in how much money they were saving. I'd take them to the bank. But very important to instill savings in a child. I think a lot of parents don't realize how important for ch it is for children to understand money. Let's have another break. <laughs> Paul Orfeli, would I have a halakha in your arujo? Paul, why Kinkos? Well, I had to have a business. And what I liked about Kinkos is it didn't have any inventory. It was a service. And basically, people don't 
we sold time on machines. And, he did, and I didn't have to worry about the inventory. My father made women's clothes. His inventory went out of business. I used to sell the vegetables on the corner. My inventory rotted. I, was, I, I didn't have inventory. It was a great, it, it just rent time on machines. Who made you think about it? How did you get into this line of business? First of all, if you approach life, that life is very successful. The most successful book, non-religious book in the world, is the Yellow Pages. Every page is a success story. They wouldn't be there if they weren't doing something constructive. You, you, ma you make it successful. No, it's the, not successful by, by itself. The fact that somebody buys something from somebody else, that's a success. The, fact, the mere fact that they exist means it's successful. And if you view the world as a bunch of successful transactions, and you view the world that it works, and it works very well, you'll do a lot better off than you always look for the dysfunctionality. So I started my business because I saw people in line. I figured if they're lying here, why didn't they be in line here? Mm -hmm. It's that simple. That was it? Yes. So you opened a very tiny shop on the road going to the University of California in Santa Barbara. It was in a garage. Yes. Huh? Yes. A very tiny place. And from modest beginnings, Kinkos grew up uh, to become the world's leading business services chain, over 1,200 stores and more than 23,000 co-workers. Unable to fill in a form, unable to concentrate, you're restless, you suffer from ADD, attention deficit disorder, you don't know how to run a machine. How were you able to manage such business? Well, you know, they had the big machines, right? Mm. Everybody w worried how they ran, how they ran, how they ran. All I knew is what came at the end I could sell. That's all I cared about. Whatever came. And so uh, I knew how to sell something. And I knew how to handle rejection. And I knew how to hustle. Mm. And I think it's very important for children to learn rejection. Learn, hustle. Learn the setbacks of life. How did the fact that you have uh, dyslexia influence your management philosophy? Well, because I think I asked a lot of questions verbally. I always asked why. And I think I was encouraged by my parents. Do you know why a child stops asking questions at two? Do you know when they're two years old, they're always asking why, 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 why? And it b bothers the people. Do you know that the, why they stop? It's because they detect it bothers other people, not that they're not curious. Children are innately curious. And why? If you want a child with a good education, count how many times they're asking why in the daytime. Questions are better than answers. We've gotten school, I think in my estimation, school's gotten too much on answers, not about questions. And the best questions are the unanswered questions. You say hiring is a gamble. It's a shoot of dice. You manage a culture, you manage an environment, but you don't manage the individual. How do you hire? I used to take people out to dinner and I'd like to see how they drink, because I think the real personality comes out when they're drinking. And in Latin, it goes, there's a saying, in vito veritas, in wine there is truth. And I'd always ask them how they got along with their parents. And for whatever reason, they didn't get along with their parents, I knew they wouldn't get along with me. And of the 200 Californians, senior people, we only had seven divorces, which I'm very proud of. Mm. Not that we were, we were overly religious or... We didn't care. As long as you liked your parents and you were thoughtful on the holidays, that was a big sign for me. So your choice is made upon the sparkle in their eyes. Yes. You could see it in the eyes. I could go to the stores. I had a thousand stores. I could see it when I walked in the door in their eyes. If mm -hmm. they were afraid to see me or they were proud, I could see it in their eyes. I could see that you could see a lot in people's eyes. You always said the role of management is to remove obstacles for workers. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, why does it, does it make sense for an owner to burden the workers so they can be unproductive? You want people being productive, so you remove all the obstacles. If they don't have good health insurance, if they don't have a good pension plan, those are obstacles to them, lo their loyalty and their performance. So I always believed that my job was to make their lives happy. So if somebody has a hard time with a business schedule, it becomes one of your worries. Everything is the owner's worry. And you sometimes find a solution for that? Well, sometimes. But sometimes you have to live with unanswered questions. Mm. In 2004, Kinko's 
was acquired by the FedEx Corporation, and Paul Orfeli is no longer involved. Why did you sell your business? Because it, it owned me, and I wanted to enjoy my family and enjoy my life. And I have so many interests in life. You know, I have two children. Or I had noticed some people always have to be entertained by others, or others can be entertained by themselves. I could always entertain myself. So I found the world so interesting, I didn't need this, and I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't something I really enjoyed, the business. It didn't intellectually challenge me. And I like what I do now. I teach school, I uh, visit, no pressure. It's easy. Come on, for 35 years, you were running a business oh. that generated millions and millions. I don't want to say billions, but let's say hundreds of millions. And you say, it didn't challenge you? Oh, it challenged me a great deal. But you understand, I didn't enjoy it anymore. Anymore? I never really enjoyed it that much. People think it's crazy when I say, if I take my 100 happiest moments, work is not one of them. What you're saying is ambiguous. Yes. But if I reflect back on my 100 happiest moments, the birth of my children, the festivities, the joyful things in my life, my parents, Kinko's is not in the top 100. Do you miss it today? No, not at all. Halas. Mm. It was worth $2 billion. How much did you sell it? Oh, not enough. I, I think we should have gotten more. How much? I, didn't, I, I, I don't remember. It's hard. Less to, than its value or more than its value? I don't remember. It's hard Come to on. think about. No, I can't. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just hard. I don't know how to remember. This it's, is a transaction of your life. I, I know, I know. But uh, uh, my mother and father wouldn't let me answer that question. Perfectly. Let's have the last break before we go on with our interview. As the Mushahideen, and the Sirah al Akhira, before the end of this hadith, and this is the Paul Orfali, the Lord of the Lord. Let's go القسم الأخير من لقائنا الليلي مع بول أورفالي مثل ما قلنا بأول حلقة وخلال هذا الحديث هو مؤسس متاجر وفروع كينكوز الموجودة في كل أسقاع الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية. بول أورفالي you refer to your retirement as being repurposed. What range of business activities are you involved in today? Well, my cousin who's married to uh, Nara Ajubaudi. Abu Jaudi. Abu Jaudi. Uh, and I are in real estate. I have a uh, data, uh, computer business. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a money management business. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a, uh, maybe 30 coffee shops that somebody, uh, that they run. I just do things, little things. All in LA? No, all around the country. Around the country. Uh, what about uh, the Orfali Foundation and your philanthropic activities? Uh, the most needy people in the world are single parents. In the United States, only 43% of the homes have a male figure in them. And so my primary cause is single mothers particularly. And uh, we do a lot with daycare and making their lives better. But it's so easy to give money to the art, to the music, and yet the person you see every day has next to nothing. And so uh, that's our cause. What about uh, Lebanon, Syria, the area here, the region? We'd like to give scholarships, and I think maybe uh, uh, to Dr. Jabra at L LAU. LAU. Lebanese uh, I'd like to give scholarships to students. Mm -hmm. But I, want pe I think if you give people uh, learning, it's the best, uh, best tonic for the world. You're a public speaker in high demand at universities and business organizations. Why do you think you're now very famous for being a brilliant and distinguished speaker, public speaker? I think because maybe I don't take myself too seriously. Mm. 
I think the big problem is once you take yourself seriously, you're going to lose it. I'm superstitious. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I don't know. If, it's hard to, uh, I, I can't answer that. It's hard. Maybe you're spontaneous or over spontaneous? I don't, you know, I, you'll see your ear. I see your ear better than you do, don't yeah. you? Don't I see I? yours, of course. I only see myself in two dimensions. You see me in three. I, it's hard for me to and comment more. on myself. It, yes, <laughs> in the time element. Yes, the fourth, in my multi-body. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, a business leader. Paul, visionary. Or Paul, philanthropist. Which title suits you more and better? Paul the inquisitive. I like better. Copy this uh, with the name of a book, uh, an autobiography. Uh, what did you want to share with the public in that book? I want primarily with the audience was mothers and children, because I couldn't read as a child. I didn't know how to read till I was 12. I, was ex I couldn't sit still. I was always running, running, running. I was expelled from many schools. And I don't know how to fix things. I have no mechanical ability. I can't run, I can't do the stick shift. And so, I uh, wanted to share how important it is just to have a nurturing home, not to take life seriously, that in life you have to be good at one thing. Do you remember the movie City Slicker? No. That, well, there was this man who was very good on the horses, very good on the horses. And the other people went to the man, Jack Palance, and said, what is your secret to life? Why are you so successful? And Jack Palance put up his finger and said, in life, you only have to be good at one thing. So uh, I think we make too much in school about being good at everything at the expense of focusing on what we like to do the most and are good at. Forbes magazine, People magazine, Fortune magazine, New York Times profiled you as one of the prominent leaders. Uh, you've been awarded by so many organizations. You've received prestigious awards from George Bush as well as from many different institutions. What's next? Uh, what's next? Any new challenge? Okay. I think that the next phase of my life is I'd like to give back to the world. And uh, I like giving back in school. I teach